Good day, Cindy. Thanks so much for agreeing to do this video interview with me today over Skype. Guy, it is great to be here with you. We go back a long way, don't we? <laughs> we do go back a long way uh, social media wise. We've never met face to face except really? out today. Um, but for our audience, would you please introduce yourself? Yes. So hello, everyone. I am Cindy Huggett, and I'm joining you today from my home office in Raleigh, North Carolina, where it is pouring down rain. And we are looking forward to hopefully some early spring and sunshine. So can you tell us a little bit about uh, your background? Let's start with, so where did you grow up? Well, I'm originally from Pittsburgh, so I love the snow and I love the cold weather. And when I had opportunity to go to university, a friend of the family said, you should check out this school in Virginia called James Madison University. And when I went to visit, everybody was so friendly on the campus. I thought that sounds like a great place to go to school. And so I found myself in Virginia after uh, high school and was there for four years. What did you study? Well, I studied, <laughs> I got to the very last semester when you had to declare a major. I think I was a junior and my advisor said, well, let's look at all the classes you've taken because you uh, have probably enough credits. And we figured out I had enough credits to get a major in geography and international affairs. So I focused the rest of my time on uh, cultural anthropology, cultural geography, studying international affairs. And then guy, I wasn't finished studying and I needed to get back home to my family in Pittsburgh. So my grandparents said if I moved back home, they would support me uh, in going to grad school. And I went to the University of Pittsburgh. So I went straight through um, and got a master's degree in international affairs. Guy, this is gonna totally date me, but uh, I did a concentration in Soviet studies. Uh, and so, spent two years there. By that time, I realized at the end of my grad school career that I didn't really love what I was studying, not that I didn't love studying people and cultures, um, but I loved my graduate assistantship. I loved teaching. I loved working with international students. At that time, personal computers were just coming into the workplace. So I, in a conversation with a professor, discovered that there is an entire field of adult education, of workplace learning, because I knew I didn't want to work with children. I enjoyed working with adults. So I packed my bags. I moved to Charlotte, North Carolina in the early 90s, and I got a job as a software instructor, a computer instructor, right when personal computers were coming into the workplace. Oh, very cool. That's a great story. So, uh, what do you what do you what do you do now? Explain for our folks here. You know what uh, you're a consultant, I believe, and uh, you render services and products to the marketplace. So, so what what is it that you do, and who do you do it with? Yes. So in a nutshell, I help organizations move to the virtual classroom. So I specialize in live online learning, the virtual classroom, uh, which in 2020 uh, became uh, such a hot uh, commodity as people were moving across the globe to virtual learning. It wasn't new. It had been around for 20 plus years, uh, but many organizations were discovering it. So uh, it probably makes sense to tell you back in the early 90s when I got started teaching those early software programs, it was things like DOS programming and when Windows finally came out, Windows 3.1 and in the in the 1994, 95 timeframe started teaching how to use the internet type of classes. And uh, I remember one workshop I taught, I would just put names of websites on the whiteboard, uh, monster.com and the discovery of people going to monster.com and realizing, well, that's a job search site. So uh, that 
comfort with technology, got some Microsoft certifications, started teaching networking and, and other things. That comfort with technology, by the time I moved out of solely technology training and started focusing in training manager roles and developing instructors, I felt comfortable with it. In the early 2000s, so almost 20 years ago now, uh, I was a one-person training department for a global organization. I was asked to cut my budget, stop traveling, and still provide training to my global workforce. So fortunately, that company had purchased a really early version of what's now WebEx. It was called WebEx then. I started using WebEx to deliver my classes. And back in the early 2000s, that was brand new. I was figuring it out as I went, but I took what I knew about learning. I took what I knew about technology, put them together and uh, fast forward to now. That's what I've been doing for almost the last 20 years. Very cool. Can you share with our audience uh, some of your early influences, either in the instructional uh, a domain, a design domain or the technology domain? Absolutely. So after getting into the field, so Guy, you know that there are some who choose instructional design or training and development as a field. And then there's many of us who just fall into it. And so after a couple of years in the industry as an instructor and a training manager, I realized I needed a foundation of, of theory and what I was doing. So I actually went to a certificate program at uh, through the University of North Carolina. Uh, it was a training and development program where I started learning learning the theories. I started learning about what I was doing and I realized I was doing these things. I just didn't know what they were called. And, um, you know, at the time I discovered performance consulting, the Robinsons, uh, Joe Wilmore had uh, written a book on performance basics, um, learning about just adult learning theory, Malcolm Knowles, like hey, there's a reason why these things work and uh, a, a number of others. When I, in the early years of trying to do virtual training and figuring it out, I had worked for a company previous uh, called ExecuTrain, it was a software training company, and they had something called a click and class model where, uh, you know, starting to bring in the internet and uh, William Horton, Bill Horton um, had done some work through Macromedia, which is now Adobe Connect and had written uh, some books. And so I look at those influences on, um, where I am now, even the Department of Energy back in the mid 90s came out with a book, uh, and we wouldn't call it an ebook then, but we do now, uh, you know, a paper on instruction with technology. And many of those were just early influences. One more, um, I loved uh, the Games Trainers Play book series. And while that's not truly instructional design, the idea that you can infuse interaction into learning experiences, um, that it doesn't just uh, mean you're teaching a lecture and especially online, really the combination of all of that formed my thinking about education, performance, learning, training, all of that. Well, very cool. Thank you for that. So let's shift back a little bit to, you mentioned the Robinsons uh, and the performance consulting and that. So uh, tell us a little bit about uh, how you, what, what you thought about performance, the uh, performance orientation and how that manifested itself in, in some of your work. So when I think about just in general, performance improvement and performance consulting, it's the heart of what we do as instructional designers, as learning professionals, and as trainers. And I think, you know, I work a lot with facilitators, with instructors, with trainers, um, almost more so than I do with designers. And I think there's a little bit of a fear, that's a strong word, um, and, and maybe too intense of a word to use, um, 
But bottom line, our goal as learning professionals is to improve performance. And so thinking about the idea of when we're contracting or working with a stakeholder, we're finding out what performance needs do you have? Where's the gap? Where are you wanting there to be uh, performance and where not? So whether we use that language or use that terminology, it's underlying what we do. And the foundation of performance improvement, performance technologies, performance consulting, having learned that fairly early on in my career um, has, has formed and shaped. And I think it should. I don't think as facilitators and trainers, we should shy away from or, or be fearful in any way of talking about the systematic process of helping our audience do their jobs better, learn something a little bit more. Mm -hmm. Is there a, is there a Pittsburgh connection between you and the Robinsons? Because I believe that's the area that they were from. And uh, when I first met them, I was walking into the headquarters of Alcoa building and they were, they were also walking in and the people I was with knew them. And so I got introduced to them, but uh, so uh, is that, is that uh, that's awesome. uh, orientation, no. the Pittsburgh connection? <laughs> not at all, not at ah. all. Although uh, Pittsburgh, uh, you will find people I have found from Pittsburgh all over the country. Um, so many people uh, stay, but uh, a lot of us have left. And uh, I, so I wish I knew that. I would love to run, have run into them somewhere. Uh -huh. Well, Jim is retired, and I we, I did a video with Dana last summer, and uh, mm -hmm. retired now too. But uh, they had a big influence across the field, I think. And uh, as, as some of my gurus said about them, they were much better at marketing the whole notion of performance improvement than anybody else. And so they did a they did a fabulous job, and they've got a, uh, a bunch of books and articles, and people I think should go back and look at that. Mm -hmm. Shift gears here a little bit. Uh, if you were to give us a 30 second elevator speech on what it is that you do to provide an example here for our audience, what would yours be? So today I help classroom facilitators move those skills to the online classroom to engage and involve their audiences to enable learning. I help organizations move to the virtual classroom, designers redesign their classes for online engagement and facilitators facilitate interactive online events. Thank you. I didn't time that, that but you're probably one of the few people who, <laughs> who came in under the mark. As a lifelong learner, can you share with us uh, what you're focused on? What are you trying to uh, learn nowadays? A couple of things, and I'm so glad you asked this question because a few years ago, I started seeing some of the traditional classroom, virtual classroom platforms, uh, WebEx and Zoom and Adobe start to add in elements of, or at least the foundation of elements of virtual reality and immersive technologies into their program. So for example, Skype uh, for HoloLens, when Microsoft came out with their HoloLens, there's a little bit of buzz about who was using that in combination with Skype. And uh, there were a couple of announcements from other uh, platforms and it piqued my interest because if I'm helping facilitators use these technologies, what do they need to know about that? And what's the what's the look ahead to what organizations will be doing with virtual reality, augmented reality in combination with virtual classrooms? So I started poking around. I started doing a little bit of research on that. And I discovered that um, when we think about virtual and augmented reality, so much of that was being designed or being developed as standalone learning experiences, but not all. That there were still many uh, technology-based simulations that needed facilitator intervention. Uh, perhaps you as an employee, as an employee of an organization, were immersed into a simulation that was highly emotional, highly uh, realistic, 
And then it finishes, well, the facilitator role in debriefing that, what an important skill it is. And so for the past couple of years, I've been doing some research and I'm writing my next book. This will be book number five on facilitation skills for immersive environments. And the idea of immersive environments is VR and incorporating AR but also the immersive virtual classroom. Uh, one of the silver linings, there's not many, but one of the silver linings of 2020 is that virtual classroom platforms have leapt forward in their development and enhancing features. Uh, for a long time, many platforms would do an update once a year, once every other year. Now it's every month they're coming out with new features, new updates. And what that's doing is allowing us to incorporate more things into our virtual classes. So for example, Zoom or Microsoft Teams, they're screen sharing platforms. We can share our screens, which means we can share anything on our screens. We can share um, websites, we can share uh, 3D simulations, we can share just so much more uh, using these technologies. So bottom line guy, I'm working on um, a new book that should be out later this year uh, on facilitation skills in immersive environments. And I'm so excited about that. So your website is cindyhuggett.com. And if we add the slash resources, we could find a whole bunch of your uh, writings and such. Can you tell, give the audience here a, a little overview of what they might find in, in this uh, treasure chest? Yeah, so I'm a big believer in sharing what I know, and I have an entire page on my website at cindyhuggett.com slash resources that are links to articles I've written or my other books, but I include anytime I do a webcast uh, that is available to the you know wider audience, anyone who wants to join, or um, checklists that I use in my work, uh, virtual classrooms, um, um, ebooks, job aids, I put them out there for download. I have a newsletter that I send out about once a month if anyone is interested in keeping up with the new resources that I post, um, you know, want to get a glimpse into where I'm speaking on webcasts, you can sign up for the newsletter on the website. But the majority of what I have out on my website is just freely available for download, uh, for your personal use or for use in creating more engaging learning experiences. Thank you. I'll, I'll put the uh, URLs in the show notes here on, on the YouTube video. Thanks, Guy. Let me shift gears here a little bit. So our language, our terminology in the field has got, uh, we, you know, we're opportunity rich here. We've got so many problems, I think, with it uh, overlapping in gap terms. And so my next question is about, is there a favorite uh, performance improvement or instructional design uh, term or phrase that you'd like to define for us? And normally when I set this up, it's, it's, it's because perhaps you feel it's being misused or misconstrued and you want to put your spin on it. So if you have one or more, uh, let's, let's hear what, what you have to say about uh, some of our language. So I knew you were going to ask me this question uh, in advance, full disclosure. And the first thing that came to my mind is a buzzword that we have in the instructional design field started tossing around. And it's the idea of learning experience design or the learning experience designer, right? It's the, it's the hot term for instructional designers now, right? You go out to LinkedIn and you start looking at job titles, right? It's, it's, it's a fancy term. And I think there's a little bit of argument over whether or not it's just instructional design with a new name or it's deeper. And I fall in the camp that I do think it's it's a little bit deeper in um, really taking the idea of focusing on the learner and the learner experience and creating um, a solution that is that is solely learner focused. And yes, instructional designers should have been doing that all along, however. But here's the reason this came to mind because it ties into the work we're doing and that or the work that I'm doing. And that is if we're 
updating the idea of instructional design to learning experience design, then we need to be doing the same on the facilitation side. And um, I think uh, as a new term or uh, a term that I have started using, um, the learning experience facilitator, that as facilitators, we're facilitating our participants learning. We're facilitating that experience when we're talking about an immersive experience, when we're talking about a learning journey, a blended program. Um, but there are times when uh, it's not just to the design, right? We've got to have the facilitator role. And um, I think we should be talking more about that in our field. Uh, we design it and then it gets facilitated and even the self-led or self-directed learning experiences would benefit from having uh, somebody shepherding or assisting or enabling. We can use a lot of different terms there um, with varying degrees of involvement from the facilitator, but I think we uh, need to not overlook the importance and the role that uh, the learning experience facilitator would provide. I think that's an excellent point. You know, too often we we hear warnings about, you know, the people are going to go away. It's going to be lights out factory kind of a thing for instructional design. And mm -hmm. we need facilitators to set up, you know, what needs to be learned, what's going to be covered. And, and especially in the debriefing, as you mentioned a little bit earlier. Um, so, yeah, facilitating the entire experience and making sure that it's focused on the learner and, you know, what what's important for them to learn, depending on their context that this is all happening in but uh, yeah. and also that. guy when we think about learner motivation you know so much is going to um, a self-directed learning journey type of model and some of our learners are really self-motivated but I can think of myself classes that I've signed up for that I've been so excited about every good intention and then I don't complete it for whatever reason, but had I been part of a group, had I been um, shepherded by a facilitator who checks in periodically, perhaps my motivation might have been a little different. And so I would say that uh, the, the community aspect and the facilitation aspect, even in those self-led journeys can really add value. The nudge factor, I think. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, let's uh, wrap up here. So uh, th again, thanks for uh, agreeing to participate in this with me. But uh, my final question to you is, do you have any parting words of wisdom or guidance for our audience, especially those who are new to the field? And I think I'd like to put a little spin on this. For those people who are facilitators of learning, learning experiences, what guidance would you have for them? What, you know, what there's just starting off, you know, what, uh, how can you uh, help them blaze their own trail through the forest of instructional design and tools and techniques? Yeah, Guy, I think there's three things, three things to talk about. And the first one is to get involved in a community and uh, of like-minded designers, facilitators, and whether that's through a local ATD chapter, whether that's through an online community in one of the social media platforms, whether that's um, by starting to attend an industry conference, meeting some people and forming your own network. I don't think we can underestimate the importance. When I look back over my career, when I look back from my journey uh, from an instructor to a training manager, to a director, to a consultant, to an author, um, every step of the way, it has been because of a connection, because of a person, because of a community, because of a recommendation, because of word of mouth, um, that has been uh, my story. And 
I think even today in the age where we're not meeting face to face, but we're still meeting online in most locations, the importance of joining a community, uh, being willing to share, being willing to uh, offer and, and, and learning along the way. Number one, um, highly, highly recommended. Number one, it actually probably covers all three of them, but <laughs> to, to uh, pull out number two is especially as somebody who is new uh, to the field, you come in and, and of course there's processes to learn or a pattern to learn or the theories to learn. Why do we do what we do? Um, but first and foremost, it should be to put ourselves in the shoes of our learners, of our participants. What's their experience and what do they need to know? What do they need to know to do their jobs better? And we can create the best learning experience in the world, but if it's not in the context of what our learners need, it, it won't be very useful. So um, putting ourselves uh, and keeping that in the forefront, number two is what I'd recommend. And then number three, technology has been changing and will continue to rapidly change as we move forward in the future. Don't be afraid to try new things with technology. Somebody like me who's been doing virtual training for 20 years, I've got in some ways the, well, this is how we've done it. And so here's how you do it. There are so many new tools and innovations that are coming into uh, the trainer's uh, world. Um, try, experiment. You know, I'm doing that every day and learning uh, new things. And I would say somebody new who doesn't have the past baggage is actually at an advantage because you can come in and say, look at this really cool new tool. Let's give it a try and uh, use it. So those are my three tips for anyone who's just getting started or really for anyone who's interested in the field. Good advice. Thank you so much. Thanks again for doing this video interview with me and I look forward to seeing you, uh, your continued contributions on social media and someday maybe face to face. Thanks for having me, Guy. It's been great chatting with you. All right. Bye-bye.